you know how I let you have the screen? I have a share screen slides, button. Yes? Hmm? So I've got a share screen button, but it says host disabled participant screen yeah, share. Yeah, I'm still figuring that part out too. Share screen, all panelists. Who can sh start sharing when someone else is sharing? Only host, okay, share. Now what happens? Now I only see us tiny and I don't see your screen. See. I am screen sharing, it says. Yep, I'm seeing your screen here. Well, that's not helpful. So it, it looked like it was letting me do something before you did the last step. Did you enable everybody else's screen? screen share? No, let's see. You're a very patient audience. Thank you very much. New share, stop share. Okay, I'm not sharing. You need to empower him to share his screen. I might okay. be empowered now because it's letting me, so let me see if I, if I do this, hold on. There we go, wow. Yeah. Now we're getting somewhere. All right. Let me introduce you properly. Well, not really properly. First, I feel compelled to sing. Oh, 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 it's magic. I didn't really hit the note. You know, but that's not how you pronounce his name, ladies and gentlemen. Not I know quite. how to pronounce it because I got a little bit of tutelage this week. It's Ma Shay. Yeah. Mache, yep, like, like macho with a long A at the end, Mache. There's like a whole video on it. And his last name is Jakuki. Jakuki, that one's a bit easier. And it's fun to say, especially if you're in high school and you want to ridicule someone, I have to think. Yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been quite the journey with, with the name as a whole. So I, I was born in Poland and, uh, and, and it's a common name over there, but then it makes no sense in, in the US here at all. So lots of uh, distinct advantages and, and disadvantages as well. The advantages being you don't get called on a class. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it was uh, time and time again, you could just see the teacher kind of going through, you know, whatever, whatever. And even now, if, if folks don't know me, they'll be going through and they'll kind of pause and you can see they're trying to figure it out and they don't know what you're doing. <laughs> uh, and and everything you just say here, just raise your hand and you're like, yep, that's me. And then <laughs> that's that forward, they're embarrassed, so they're never going to call on you. Mm -hmm. And the disadvantage is you don't get your mail. Yeah, the, the mail thing really, I mean, every piece of paper I ever sign and like people think that the J on the back side of the name is a middle initial or they just, it just gets butchered left and right. So I've got so to be like, you Macy? Macy is common, um, you know, I've, all kinds of stuff. The, the, another advantage though is every conversation I ever have with a new person starts like this. So you can put me in That's any an and it's like full confidence because I've re replicated this conversation 10,000 times in my life. You, you know how big my ego is, right? Can you tell me anything that's different about this time? Has anyone ever sung at you first or introduced you to the world this way in a big webinar format? It's may, maybe not quite the webinar format, but the, the Macho Man song comes up, the Magic song comes up. It's, it's mm. really, it's going to be hard for you to come up with something that, uh, that I haven't heard before. I'm going to work on it. <laughs> In the meanwhile, why don't I just sh the hell up and give you a chance to speak because you are here to educate us on stuff. Teach us. Sure. No, I, uh, I, I appreciate it. So um, I've been involved with this community here for, for the last six weeks or so, um, and I really appreciate the discussions and insight and a lot of the topics. It's been a great opportunity to learn and make connections, and I'm excited to, to give you guys a chance and see a little bit of a glimpse into my world you know, and, and hopefully you don't throw me out of here by the end of it and, and we can have some fun. If you make it to the end of it. If I make it to the end, I might just get deleted. So, you know, as, as we've seen over the last, I guess, couple of weeks, um, there's quite a lot of testing for med device companies to cover in. In my role in my company, you know, we're responsible for taking these devices and breaking them into pieces and just smashing them and doing all kinds of other stuff to understand how strong they are and how they're going to function in the body. So, what I was hoping to do is just uh, maybe give some insights into some proactive thought patterns for OEMs and designers and, and educate a little bit about the, the world that I live in. Um, 
Let's see if this switches. There you go. So, so a quick background. We've already covered the whole name thing. I should have had a slide just to say, yep, here's, here's the things that we just covered. Um, but I, uh, I, I work for a company called Element Materials Technology. I'm the medical device manager. And essentially what that means is I, I do a lot of different things. But mostly I'm managing large customer relationships, focusing on strategy, business development, and providing a lot of technical support to, to the different groups. I don't get to spend much time in, in the lab anymore, um, but as you can see in the picture, I do. I have been in the lab, and when the uh, corporate photographer shows up and, and you volunteer, you don't quite realize that you're going to be using pictures of yourself um, in all types of communication, and your face will be showing up on, you know, all kinds of banners across the company and things like that. But you know, you you, you live and you learn. Next time, maybe I'll, I'll be a little bit more strategic about it. Um, so I have a biomedical engineering background. I've been in the industry for about 15 years, uh, mostly in orthopedics, but also been dabbling in cardiovascular over the last couple. Um, you know, involved in multiple ASTM uh, subcommittees. So essentially, uh, most testing is governed by some sort of standardization committee. ASTM is the American Society for Testing and Materials, which authors and develops many of the test standards and specifications. So that's, uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more later on. And I'm also some uh, associate adjunct faculty at the University of Cincinnati College of Pharmacy. So that's something I've been doing the last couple of years, just teaching classes very similar to some of the stuff that we'll cover on here, um, just to give uh, some of the pharmacological student or uh, pharmacy students um, kind of a broader view of med device and understanding how the pharma world integrates with, with med device. Contact information on there in case you need to get a hold of me, but that's, uh, that's a little bit more about, about Mache. And uh, with that, we can jump into sort of the next, the next piece. So um, there, there's multiple classes and types of devices. There's electrical and battery powered medical devices. There's combination products, which cross over in pharma. There's instrumentation, delivery systems, orthopedic and cardio implants, and so on and so on. It's all the stuff that we're working on uh, in the industry. And all of them require some level of, of performance testing. The more life sustaining or preserving the, the implant is, um, you know, the more testing is gonna be needed. And, and the scope for this talk or discussion here is really looking at from an orthopedics perspective, but hopefully the concepts are applicable across the board to, to most of the devices. Um, I, I, have the, I have a unique privilege of working with many men device companies on their new and existing products. And, you know, having all the medical technology come across my desk, some of it is, uh, you know, it's truly a privilege because you get to see what's working, what's not working. You need to see sort of the pipeline before it hits the market. And it's fun always to walk through a trade show and be like, yep, we tested that and we worked with this company and they're working on this and just have that, that knowledge across the board. So it's kind of a, a privileged position to be in. Um, you know, but, but at the same time, you know, when we look at these devices, it's pretty rare to see something really revolutionary. Every now and then some unique technology comes up or someone's trying to do something different. A lot of it is very similar to what's already out there on the market. So. You know, when, when through that lens, when I pick up the phone and I'm talking to a customer for the first time, when they say, so what do I need? What do I need to do a test? That's the most common question that I get. You know, what do I need to test and, you know, what methods, so forth, and what do I need to do to get FDA approval? And it's really quite a loaded, a loaded question. Um, you know, and, and what I try to do is look at the target audience um, and, um, you know, the, the profile of kind of who I'm working with and within med device, there's, there's a lot of, you know, different folks that you're engaged with. So, you know, you have your startups, you sort of have your mid tier, you have, um, you know, you have large companies, some of the more mature companies. And then within those companies, you've got, you know, all kinds of people that you're working with. And this is where, where it really starts to get fun. So you can have conversations with um, surgeons in a garage that have a new great idea. You know, you can have engineers that are at the start of their career that really aren't sure what they're doing, but they're excited to be a part of med device and trying to work on something. You know, there's engineers that are shifting from one device, they might be hip or cardio and they're going to spine or trauma. And you've got folks that have a lot of experience in either one particular type of device or, you know, multiple types of devices as a whole. So answering that question, ultimately, you know, you kind of get to the same net result, but you know, knowing, knowing what to test and how to test looks different for kind of each one of those categories and where they are in the process. So I hope to share some, some experience here and not dive too deep into the technical or details. Joe, I know those are your favorite, um, you know, and come away with some proactive steps to make a positive impact on, on, on the business if you're looking from a testing perspective. 
Sound good? Awesome. Um, <laughs> um, so, uh, just silence means agreement with everything that I'm saying. So as long as you keep everybody muted, I'm, I'm good to keep rolling, right? Or it means I was typing and you didn't want to hear all of my clacking. Please continue. <laughs> no worries. Um, so I thought it'd be helpful to, to kind of highlight a common implant that gets talked about. So everyone knows someone that's had a, a, that's had a hip replacement, um, you know, either a parent or a cousin or a grandmother or whatever. So it should be pretty familiar across the board. And if not, you've seen the commercials for, uh, from the lawyers on television. Do you have a hip replacement? You know, have you had challenges? Have you had some sort of allergy or sensitivity and so forth? Because you know, that, that, that some, some unfortunate things have happened in the industry. So, you know, when, when you ask the question, what do I need to test my device? It really starts at understanding, you know, what your device is and what your device is not and how is it different for the things that are out there. So if you look at a standard sort of testing suite for a hip implant, um, you know, you're gonna kind of start from a regulatory perspective. You're gonna identify your strategy, do some risk analysis. And then ultimately you need to be able to understand both your material and your product. So a standard hip will be made out of titanium, it'll have a cobalt chrome head, it'll have a polymer um, sort of liner, and likely another titanium uh, cup in there. And so you've gotta be able to understand the materials and characterize them, and at some point, those materials get um, you know, forged or machined into some sort of product. And so that product is, is testing is where we tend to come in, and we do, this is probably the majority of the work that I'm involved with, but what we're trying to do is break these things. We're trying to put them through physiological forces to make sure that these are going to withstand what they're going to see in your body as, as you're abusing these implants, you know, take, you know, take a hip and imagine going out and dancing a bunch or kicking a soccer ball or something like that. Those are pretty excessive motions and forces that you're putting in on these devices. Um, if you take a knee replacement and you're standing there, you know, it's not a big deal to stand there, but you start walking upstairs, you start riding a bike and all of a sudden you're, you're putting a ton of forces on these things. And, and that's where the valuation piece comes in. Hip replacement is also a good example because you have different materials. So when you have a cobalt chrome and a titanium couple, or you have you know, different sort of materials that are engaged with each other, there's the potential for corrosion. You don't want things corroding in your body. You don't want debris coming off of these things. You know, and a lot of that gets sort of combined into different testing methods. You're looking at you know, where testing, how long is this thing gonna last before it fails? You're characterizing all the different components. You're looking at your porous coating. You're looking at, and again, I'm getting into details here a little bit, but, but you get the picture. Um, so that's sort of the, the benchmark mechanical performance piece. And then on top of that, you have to take a look at your manufacturing methods. You have to take a look at biocompatibility, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago. You're looking at cleaning and sterilization validation, surgical instrument evaluation, uh, medical packaging, and all that other kind of stuff. So when you ask the question, what do I need to do to test my device? Bam, for a standard device, there's sort of your, your overall scope, but then it gets really tricky the more unique you get. So let's say you have this latest and greatest revolutionary technology. You are 3D printing your stem, you are coating your cobalt uh, head, you are creating some crazy polymer formulation, you have some really unique never seen before locking mechanism. Now you've taken this basic sort of matrix and made it really, really complex. And you've got to sift through the risks and understand, um, you know, what is, uh, you know, what is important, what is not important, how do I evaluate this? And, and it becomes really complex. And we'll kind of talk about that as uh, through, through the rest of the talk. Um, another quick comment as well as, you know, it, it, we do a lot of work at Element with, uh, with the aerospace industry. So, they are you know, designing new alloys, they have high temperature alloys, they have all kinds of other materials that they're looking at and characterizing. And then they have a service light for these components. So you put an engine on a plane, you put some other component on a plane, you know that it's good for these many flight hours. And then at some point you get to the end of the service life and then you replace it, right? Or you, or you retire the, the part or whatever it is. It's not necessarily like that in med device. In med device, you're really limited to different materials, uh, to a much smaller sort of scope of materials, your titaniums, your stainless steels, some polymer, some ceramics, cobalt chrome, and so forth, which kind of puts limitations on, um, on, the, on, the, on the, the design side. But then also you're trying to squeeze these things into the body into a particular shape, right? You're not gonna go design a hip and make it three feet tall and put up some crazy geometry because it's just not gonna work physiologically. 
And then at some point, you're going to test this device and you're going to say, I test it to this many cycles, which has a five or a 10 year equivalence. And, you know, and then at that point, we're sort of keeping our fingers crossed because we're not sure how long it's going to survive. So either the patient's going to die at that point um, because they've reached the end of their life or, you know, you're not really sure how long it's going to last. There's not a defined service life. It's not common to go in there and start taking hip replacements out because they've, they've reached some sort of uh, defined time frame and then, and then you're replacing them. So, you know, it, it's kind of unique in that sense. And, and you've got to work around that as you're, you're designing and thinking about your testing strategies. So when I outline the thought pattern that I go through in this and a lot of these discussions um, with, with med device manufacturers and dive into them a little bit in depth. And so I usually take a step back and ask some questions around, you know, the FDA guidance document. The FDA does provide some general direction. Uh, they can be vague, but they, they're done that inten intentionally in order to cover a variety of topics. But there's a lot of information in there. We'll kind of break these five down here over the next couple of slides. It also provides um, general direction for relevant test specifications. It says these are the consensus standards. This is what you need to take a look at and think about. And then, um, you know, the next two sort of go hand in hand, taking a look at your risks, taking a look at your worst case. You know, Joe, your bones and my bones are different. You know, our vascular systems are different. So you're not gonna necessarily get the same implant that I'm going to get. Hopefully neither of us have to get an implant anytime soon. Um, but you have to be able to take a look at that whole range of implants and say, of all of these, which one am I going to test and evaluate and which one is most, most likely to fail? And we'll talk about that as well. I'd like to interrupt just long enough to say that while most of this stuff is well outside anything I ever work on, I'm really appreciating your presentation. It's just linear enough for me to be able to follow. My hat to you, sir. Thanks. I appreciate that. Um, I'll try not to derail from that linearity then. <laughs> um, and, and, and so then, so obviously as you're going through sort of this, this process, what you want to do is you're, you're going to compare to something, something that's existing out there. That's what you have to do for a lot of these class two devices or for a class three, you're looking at, you know, physiological data and so forth. And then ultimately it all comes together for, in my mind in sort of a protocol. Um, and this is the document that you're using to convey why you're doing what you're doing who's doing it for you, whether you're doing it internally or sending out to an outsourced lab like us, um, and, and really communicating and getting all the information together. And it's really the most critical piece in my mind, and I'll give lots of examples as we kind of talk through this, um, of, of things not to do or, or challenges that I've kind of come up in the past. So with that, I'll just uh, jump into the FDA guidance a little bit, which I know is exciting for, for everyone here. Um, so these documents really exist to help you on your journey through product development, through the regulatory environment. They provide contact information. There's a table of contents that shows the type of things that are in there. And realistically, if you're a med device and you're involved in any of this, you've got to know what these things say. You've got to read it. That's my first comment. I'm surprised after doing this for 15 years, how many people know they exist, but they don't read them or know what's in there. And that's really just, uh, just really a shame because there's a lot of information in there that would answer a lot of the questions that they can have. I'm happy to answer those questions for you, but those tools exist without you having to, to try to engage at that point. Um, let's see here. So, so within these documents, there's a couple different items to, to talk through. And one of the things that, that is critical is paying attention to your product code and your labeling. So, uh, every time you go to you know, design this device, you have to come up with the indications for use, how it's going to be used in the body and how it's not going to be used in the body, essentially. Um, that ties back to the labeling and the product codes and so forth. And that can be a little bit confusing. There's devices that look very similar, might have similar loads, but are completely different. And you can't compare, you can't kind of uh, compare apples to apples between them. And I'll give you an example. I've been on multiple phone calls and, and involved in FDA responses where the feedback from FDA is, your device code is this, but you're comparing to a different device code. Please either provide additional information, change your product code, or repeat the testing with something relevant. If it causes unnecessary delays, just because they look the same doesn't mean you can use them interchangeably. So that's just a point to make it something that, that we've, we've ran into as well. So as you keep getting into this, you can run into um, some vagueness in the standards, and that's, uh, that's why it's important to have a good handle on what your device is and isn't and how you're managing the risks. In some case, they will specifically say, do this in this configuration, and then don't do this, or do this other thing in this configuration. 
Um, you know, and sometimes even they have acceptance criteria, which is great because everyone wants acceptance criteria. They want to know what they're shooting for. So the second most common questions after what do I need to do to test it is what is the minimum criteria to get approval? And that's kind of a loaded question as well and that, that I'll, I'll challenge here in a little bit. Um, we talked a little bit about sort of the differences between the ranges of devices and um, with worst case scenario, you might do have to do a couple of different things, but you want to identify which of your devices is most likely to fail, provide either digital simulation data or some feasibility testing if you're not sure, because you're going to have to explain to the FDA why you, you know, why you picked that particular size. And if you don't do a good job convincing them, they're going to come back and, uh, and, and they're happy to disagree with you. You know, we've seen a lot of customers um, get feedback from the response that says, you said this, but we've seen evidence that, that this is what you need to be considering, go back and retest. And you don't want to do that because then you're 10 weeks out on parts, you're eight weeks out on testing or whatever it is. And it creates, you know, for a small company, especially significant delays that can impact the, the company's performance long-term. So it's, it's something to definitely be paying attention to. Um, there's also FAQ sections at the end. That's always helpful because sometimes they give you very specific direction as what to do. Um, and if people were to read it, they would see it and not make some of these mistakes. So again, make sure that you're, you're reading these things and getting yourself pretty familiarized with it. And kind of the second piece is since you're working with the FDA, um, and again, this, uh, the, the FDA is the one who's gonna be doing the, the uh, looking at your submission and deciding whether you meet the criteria or not. You have this uh, pre-submission meeting, which I feel like customers are taking more and more advantage of. And as you're going through all this sort of thought pattern, you really want to tell them what you're doing and don't ask. You know, I've had customers that have said, we're on my sixth pre-sub and the FDA is really starting to like what we're doing. And I'm thinking you're not really getting anywhere if the goal is to try to market and sell this device. So you want to be specific with what you're doing and have these things sorted out ahead of time. There's two other resources that have been come up uh, recently over maybe the last couple of years that folks aren't necessarily aware of. And um, when you're looking at these devices and going through, through the testing, uh, FDA has actually published the, some of the data that they've had. Imagine they have this giant database of all the, um, all the submissions that they've ever seen. And so they've actually been publishing some of this data. I've got a link here and there's a variety of others as well. It really helps with seeing where you are from a product performance perspective. Um, and can make a difference in, in identifying where you sort of need to be. And the other part of that is kind of, it's a, it's a approach, it's a performance-based pathway approach where if you have a design like a, a screw or a plate or something that's, that's pretty common, not necessarily creates a lot of risk, they've actually defined just meet these criteria, you know, and you don't need to go through the whole predicate device exercise where you're comparing to something else that's out there on the market. So, Pay attention to those devices. Always look up if um, you know if if those those exist because it can really help you through through the process. All right. So so the guidance documents also refer to what's called consensus standards, which are defined and agreed test methods for a type of device. Um, you know they can be ASTM, they can be ISO or some standardization body. And again, similar feedback from the FDA guidance document. Once you identify it, read it. There's tons of information in there. There's examples, there's scope, there's test equipment to use, there's sampling requirements, there's um, you know, schematics of setups, there's procedures, there's preparation, there's terms and definitions, uh, reporting sections, statistical information on variability, there's acceptance criteria in some cases. You know, and and it, it's almost a shame to go through a testing program and then say, well, I haven't read the FDA guidance document and I haven't read the test specification, but here's a bunch of data. I should be good. And unfortunately that, that, that happens in some cases. And there's, there's a lot of mistakes that can be made along the way, which in some cases have really cost uh, companies a lot. Uh, Jay, I know that we expected you to be an expert in this or you wouldn't be presenting. I'm quite impressed with the depth of your knowledge. And I wonder if, if this is not to minimize all you do, are you focused exclusively on testing or is that just one part of a day in the life of? Yeah, so, so the company as a whole does testing across all different industries and um, you know, different methodologies. That, that's what we do, we provide testing services. Um, you know, we support customers with things like 
uh, research and development projects. We support them with uh, kind of an extension of, of their R&D in some cases. We're not necessarily doing it or driving it, but depending on you know, what people are trying to do internally will um, definitely be a, um, a place where you can brainstorm some different ideas and talk about either devices, understand what you're doing. But most of, most of what we're doing falls back on the, the physical testing and providing results to, to the customers. So in my role specifically, you know, I, I do a lot of talking with customers to try to understand what do they need throughout the entire process? What other capabilities could they use? How can we come alongside of them and partner with it? So, you know, I, I have the technical background and, and I like being able to work that, but it's also fun to work with people and try to understand, you know, what are their challenges and, and how can we can align to better serve them there? We have our first question, panelist Rick Stockton, with the impressive avatar and semi-little advertisement about his services. I don't know where you picked up that trick. Go ahead with your question. Okay, quick question. Um, when I'm preparing testing or when I'm preparing a recommendation for testing for my customers, a lot of times I'm concerned that my testing may be too narrow. I actually spend a lot of time trying to make sure that my testing is comprehensive over the range of use. Do you have a strategy for, uh, for preventing the testing that you do from being interpreted by the FDA as too narrow and having them suggest subsequent testing? Now, after I asked that, you partially answered the question with, you know, of course, a review of the FDA standards. But I'd like to see if you've got any other uh, strategies that you use to make sure that we don't come in with too narrow a testing ban. Yeah, yeah that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I guess maybe the next couple of slides will help answer that, that a bit further. Um, you know, it really comes back to how different the device is. If it's, if it's something that is just a, you know, a basic hip or spine or whatever device it is, um, you know, then, then it, the scope can probably be relatively narrow with what needs to happen. But, but what you really need to take a look at is what features differentiate your device from somebody else's and then do they create additional risk? You have to take a look at the features, you have to take a look at the manufacturing methods, you have to take a look at um, uh, what else, uh, you know, materials and whether you have similarities, or we, we have different materials that are engaging with each other. And again, I'm talking about an orthopedics background, but this should be applicable kind of across the board, you know, and then, and then saying what is, what is the minimum from what is defined by the guidance, but then what type of risk do these other things um, create compared to a, a standard type of device. Did myself. I'll Rick, definitely I muted myself device. and I had muted myself saying, Rick, you have muted yourself. We're yeah. learning the new technology here, folks. Richard, John Richard. So far, so good. What were you saying? No, I'm looking forward to the rest of it. Yeah. Okay. Please proceed. Uh, yep. So let's see where, where was I at here. Um, and, and and so, you know, the specifications typically are defined for a, a, a type of implant, but then inevitably you get into sort of custom methodology um, and taking a look at, let's say your device has some sort of new locking feature um, that either hasn't been seen before or is just kind of a, something that falls outside of the standard. And so, you know, what I typically recommend is as if you can identify that as a potential risk that the FDA might ask about or something that you have to prove that your screw is not going to back out or you're not going to create some sort of adverse risk, um, you know, identify a similar ASTM test method and then build off of that. It's always better than just starting from something completely from scratch. If you're making a comparison and then say, my device is the same as this other device, but we completely deviated on the testing and came up with all new testing methodologies, and and but but it's still the same. It makes it really difficult to try to, um, you know, answer some of the questions that FDA might come back if, if you're able to do that. So, you know, Rick, to, I think that that gives you a little bit more information. But as we go through this, I think it'll become a little bit clearer as well. Um, has anyone on the on the phone or on, in the meeting been a part of ASTM committees at all? 
I'm pretty sure the answer to that is yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead. Absence of their trigger figure. I'm thinking Michelle, of you, Jan, maybe, Larry, Andre, Alan, any of you? I will advise. And I would assume some of the folks looking at the experience have definitely been involved in it. What I would say is, let's get involved in the committees. So it, it, it's, it's crazy to think that these standards committees exist and you're driving at you know, improving the technology and the methodologies, but then as a company, it's in your best interest to align to those standards that more people aren't involved. They meet twice a year, you can call into the meetings at 75 bucks a year to join. You know, and when you're doing development and you can go into the room and there's 40 industry experts from your com competition in the same room talking about how to test your type of device, that's really a, a great forum to learn as well as ask some different types of questions. And so you've got FDA in there and, and you've got the FDA reviewers, which is always positive. There's academia, there's consultants, there's industry. You know, and I've, I've had multiple people say to me, you know, you're, you're kind of sitting there and you're thinking about something and then the person across the room asks the same question that you were thinking about and then that person picks up on it and you realize, wait a second, we're all trying to solve the same problems. Can we do this in kind of a unified structure? And that's how you kind of get to the AS team standard. So if you haven't a chance to participate, I strongly recommend it. It's a great way to connect and, and build a network, but also learn, uh, learn on the technical side as well. The other part that's, that's a big part of it is, um, you know, standards change over time. So if you're part of the committees, you can be ahead of the curve and knowing when a standard is changing. They get revised every five years. Typically they're, you know, some combination of editorial and procedural. If you can, if you can be ahead of the curve, then you can be ready to go when those specs run instead of trying to go back and remediate and do things like that. So just, just a quick aside, something I've been involved with and it, and it makes a big difference for, uh, for, for customers as a whole. Um, so this gets back to, to some of the other risk and worst case questions, you know, and essentially what you're trying to do is demonstrate that your unique or standard features don't create a, additional risk. You know, can you make a clear apples to apples comparison? And one of the areas that, that I think has really um, resulted in a lot of questions is sort of around the manufacturing and particularly additive manufacturing. So with, with the explosion of additive in this world, you know, you've, you're, you're designing new matrices to simulate vertebral stiffness. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than, um, you know, hitting control P and just printing your, your device to the printer. There's a lot of additional considerations that, that you have to take a look at. So, you know, what happens if your device has trapped powder in it? You know, what, what if the surface roughness is a high stress region, um, you know, uh, results in some sort of adverse effect or failure? What if there's incomplete fusion? Do you have a bead that can break off in your body? And, you know, what, what kind of debris do you want in your body? Do you want small debris or do you want large debris? Well, the answer is neither. You don't want any debris in your body. You know, if it's small, it can get into your vascular system. If it's large, it could create a lot of localized damage. But, you know, now you've introduced a whole lot of set of risks that you have to go through. And guess what? FDA has a guidance document for that. And if you read through it, they're not going to tell you exactly what to do, but they're going to say, think through these things and you know, and, and, and then come up to a justification for why you're submitting what you're submitting and why your device is uh, you know, appropriate for, for this use. Um, let's see here. So yeah, it's also important to make sure you have data to back up your, your worst case. Um, FDA needs to agree and they're happy to disagree. You know, we've seen a lot of customers that have had issues where um, FDA has come back and said, have you considered X or Y or you explained this, but you've not addressed this. Um, they'll go back into the database and say, you, know, you have this type of features. They'll go look at the clinical results and adverse effects of those types of devices with similar features. And then they can come back to you and say, please provide evidence that this feature does not do this, this, this as experienced clinically and so forth. And that just creates additional work and delays. So again, thinking through what the features are and how similar or different, and then providing the right data in order to, um, you know, sort of mitigate, mitigate those risks. Um, I've got a couple of examples uh, just to kind of talk through for, for discussion purposes of some pretty um, common and as well as maybe extreme examples of, of thinking through this. So uh, I was working with a company uh, with a standard hip stem. You know, they picked their smallest device. They ran through some analysis and they made a last second uh, sort of design change. It was close to a high stress region. It was mostly an aesthetic change. And then they manufactured their devices, you know, did everything good, expected everything to pass. 
and um, you know, 50,000 cycles into a fatigue test, the stem breaks. So there's a bit of a panic. You're trying to figure out what happened. Okay, is it one? You're running six of these, 12 of these in parallel, depending on what you're doing. You know, and then the second one breaks at 75,000 cycles. The next one breaks at 80,000 cycles, all right through where that aesthetic feature was. Um, you know, there's nothing like uh, calling a customer and telling them that this device that they just spent nine months developing and manufacturing and made this last second tweak has is now catastrophically failing. Um, you know, that's not a positive scenario to be in, but again, you know, one of the things that you wanna pay attention to is make sure that when you're testing, it's the final design, your worst case is done on the final piece um, because making a little tweak, even if that's, even if that's just aesthetic, uh, can, can make a big impact. Um, we know another example is, this comes up with uh, bone plates. So, a lot of times folks will either assume that their device is strong enough and it's going to pass. That's never a good idea. Um, you know, in some cases they'll assume it so much that they'll jump the gun and start manufacturing their parts. Then they don't realize that the spec has X criteria because they didn't read the spec. Um, you know, and, and telling the FDA that, well, these are the parts that we have and this is what we had to test because that's what we manufactured really isn't a justification that's, that's going to fly. So just make sure that you know, when you're doing your, your analysis, you understand the scope of the spec because they might be unique requirements that you need to consider in your manufacturing process as well. Michelle, you wanted to add something and we cannot see you. I, I, I know, I undocked my computer and I redocked it and it's not cooperating. Okay. Sorry about that. I'll, uh, I'll put this button like this and I think then we get to see your picture anyhow. Yeah. Or I, I can stop my, I'll stop my video over here and then I'll yeah. shoot my, okay. yeah. Okay. So, um, you, you were mentioning, you know, importance of, of telling the FDA which test you selected and why and, um, out of the guidance documents and whatnot. It's also, if you don't do something in a guidance document, you better talk about that as well not just not do it or think it's obvious why it's not applicable or uh, this is one of my favorites i have a customer argue with me right now because the guidance document says uh, uh, fda recommends you do biocompatibility per iso 10993 and they're like michelle it says recommends it didn't say we had to and i'm like well, you better have a hell of a reason why you don't think you have to do at least cytotoxicity, sensitization, and irritation. Um, so I, I just thought that that was a, a really great point of yours. And then the counterpoint, though, is, is just as uh, important. Yeah, a absolutely. You know, we, any of us that are involved in these fields, we get it. Testing can be expensive. No one wants to overtest or do things that they don't need to do in general. But you got to understand your risks and then you make it crystal clear that you know exactly why you're, you're doing it or, or not doing it. Yeah. Um, that, another example that I'll share, and this is kind of an extreme example. <clears throat> this, this is some time ago. I was working with a company that, you know, had a device. They came to us kind of a basic protocol. In this case, I was sort of, you know, working with us to guide them through the process and everything went pretty smoothly. They spent 50 grand on this testing program, got to the end and, in the, kind of the final report out closing meeting, um, there was a comment made by, by one of the engineers and the comment was something about having an additional component that went under the part. And I remember my jaw hit the floor and I said, hold on a second, what, what, what are you talking about? Like, well, we have this other piece that goes on top of this piece that, that you've been testing all along. And I'm thinking the specs are clear that you're supposed to test the full configuration in the final conditions with these devices. And what they had essentially done is they had, they had this other piece. It didn't show up on any drawings. It wasn't clear. It wasn't obvious. It wasn't anything. And I remember thinking, these guys are in trouble. And, um, and, and, and I remember calling them and saying, this, this isn't going to fly with the FDA. And they said, you know what? We, we took a look at the risk. We did some analysis. We have some justification. We don't think it's going to impact anything. We'll be fine. Well, sure enough, a month later or two months or whatever it was, FDA comes back, full rejection, says, nope, you, you need to go back, redo everything. So now they're 10 weeks out on parts, eight weeks out on new testing, you know, finally get everything through, you know, six months down the road. Um, and, and, and of course, the part starts failing. That additional component is having a negative impact on this first component. So now they're scrambling because now they have to go through another round of, of, 10, you know, uh, of 10 weeks and eight weeks and so forth. So after a couple of iterations, we're 18 months into this project. 
And, and essentially they, they couldn't pull it off. They couldn't figure out how to get their device, you know, and, and they, in my mind, it's crazy because had there been a more robust protocol or on their drawings, there was a clear indication that there was another component, we would have caught it immediately. And I just remember being flabbergasted that, you know, they're, they're, it, it was just essentially ignored. And then it resulted in the, the company's no longer in business. They, they, they had to close or really, um, you know, divest a lot. And it's just unfortunate because it could have been avoided at the front end, but it just, you know, they, they didn't think it made a big deal. They, they created justification and, and they pay the price for it, which is probably the most extreme example that I have, but it's a, uh, it's a re really interesting case. So a couple more slides here and then we'll, we'll be getting close to, to finishing up here. Um, you know, as, as you're going through your testing process, pay attention to the data, know the ballpark you need to be in, know the hard numbers preferably. Um, you know, don't, don't just make the, the assumption that your device is going to pass. It's not just a testing isn't just a checkbox at the end of the, pro, the regulatory process in order to get uh, this device to the market. And, and I think sometimes you fall into the trap of, um, you know, thinking that way, especially if it's a common implant or it's something that you think is pretty straightforward. Um, the implications of failing are severe. And even if you have a flawless design, it doesn't mean that manufacturing won't have an issue with heat treat with your parts. It doesn't mean that you don't have some sort of other quality issue. It doesn't mean that there's some other sort of problem that's going to come up. So be paying attention throughout the process and don't just, just, just make the assumption that, that you're going to be good. Um, another comment is, you know, just, just because you pass the minimum acceptance criteria doesn't mean that you understand the vice. And really what you should be asking is how close are you to catastrophic failure? So the spec says run six at this particular road. You did it. You're good to go. You're passed. You'll get your approval. And, and that's fine. But from an engineering perspective, you know, how close are you to that line? Typically in your worst case, you're pretty, you're, you're pretty close to where that line is and you're hoping that it passes. But if you're close and you have some sort of hyperphysiological event out on the field, now you've got a big potential problem. And so again, I'm not necessarily vouching for going performing tons of additional testing, but I think it's interesting to see the overall success in the companies that take the approach of just do the minimum to pass versus let's take it another step and run a couple more um, tests to evaluate, you know, how close you are to sort of this catastrophic piece and, and kind of the, the life of the device. So, you know, that, that's just something else that we've come across and it's, uh, it's interesting to take a look at that. So really, how do you, how do you summarize all this? And, and this is really my, my last slide here and it comes together in my mind in sort of this test protocol, um, you know, document what, why, where, how, and so forth. And, th and there's a couple of reasons uh, for that. You know, it, it, to me, it seems like a pretty basic concept, but, but I live in this world. I've written hundreds of protocols and some are as simple as echoing the standard and others much, much more complex. I would say typically the larger the company, the more mature their protocols are gonna be. So if you're listening to this and you're part of a startup or a smaller company, don't skip this step. You know, but it's, it's make it clear because again, the success of the company may be writing about you, you getting this right um, and, and having Masha, your- Masha, do you guys help write these protocols for people who aren't as mature? We do. We do. And, and, and there's a, there's a bit of a challenge. So, so the best way to do it is, you know, I don't necessarily have access into the design history file. I don't have access into, you know, all the decisions that are made about worst case or regulatory strategy, but we can definitely support. So the best way to, to work is, is as a team side by side where they can provide that information. And then we go in and, and take a look at what they've done. We take a look at the procedural section we take a look at their data, we take a look at our experience and sort of share that. And when you go back and forth like that, you really come out with a very robust document. So we, we do provide those services. We can help support protocol development, but it's also difficult because I don't necessarily have access to every drawing and everything else that's happening. So it's always, always a team effort. Um, and what was I gonna say? Let's see here. And essentially what you're trying to do is consolidate communication with your team, with your management, with your test lab, with your insourcing and outsourcing. You want to make sure you don't, you don't miss anything. And there's really sort of two or three other, other areas that I think are critical. So everything that we've talked to in my mind, having that document just makes it crystal clear about what you are doing, what you're not doing. It makes a big difference when going to the FDA and saying, we've thought through all this and it's crystal clear and we've all reviewed it. Everyone's on the same page versus I just sent an email that had a couple of points that said go run it for the standard. We have internal protocols, we have internal procedures, 
we can support those things, but it's not necessarily specific to your device and you're sort of limited uh, at the information that, that, that you're provided. So, you know, it, it, in my mind, um, it definitely helps mitigate risk for a valid testing program, especially if you have something complex. Um, you have complex assemblies, if they're difficult to put together. I don't know how Surgeon is gonna to put together, but some, if I can't do it, that's, that's sort of a, a challenge for you to think through. But, you know, inevitably, long term, someone's, if your company is successful, someone's going to try to repeat what you did, or they're going to try to repeat it to compare to what you did. And time and time again, I get phone calls that says, hey, uh, I'm comparing to something you guys did for us five or 10 years ago or something that we did. Can you help us figure out what actually was done? And now you're in your fourth generation of your employees. You know, I'm removed from the situation. I'm no longer in the test lab. You know, obviously both of our quality systems have matured over time. You guys didn't provide a protocol or have any ideas, and it was a whole big customized test method. Good luck trying to make that data online. It's just, it's just not, not a good situation to be in. And so when you're writing these, another big reason is if you do a good job developing the content and making it clear why you're doing what you're doing, it saves your company a significant amount of time and effort. Um, you know, in the future, because someone inevitably, if you're successful, is going to be trying to replicate that. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, I mean, th things like test schematics, fixtures, assembly information, you know, worst case parameters, uh, well, all that kind of stuff needs to absolutely be in there. And again, we can help support with that if needed. Um, but, but it's important for kind of um, mitigating that risk long term. I have a question. Um, yep. Again, the marketing guy here who doesn't really deal in this. I've learned the term B and V, validation and verification, or the other way around. Is that an, uh, a synonym for testing? Is that what you're doing when you're testing? So that's, in my mind, that's a bit of a loaded question as well. So yes, yes and no. Um, VNV is, um, is it, it depends on how the companies, each individual company is defining it. Some of the, if you have regulatory programs that you're putting together for um, you know, testing, testing submission for regulatory, um, you, that definitely falls under, under VNV, but it goes beyond that as well, because you wanna make sure that the device that you made has the parameters that you made it to but then you also want to make sure that it's going to do what you think it's going to do. So VNV goes a little bit beyond that, but this is definitely integrated with, within the, within the oh, term. Which is the broader term testing or VNV? Uh, this is more. Yeah. So, so VNV is by far much more in, in depth overall. And again, maybe Michelle or somebody else in the regulatory piece that, that deals with, with a lot of validation as well could, could comment on that. I would think that'd be a quality thing, which is also in Michelle's camp. Yep. Okay. Re repeat the question, please. What is bigger, a square or a rectangle? And what is bigger, V and V or testing? What, v and V or testing? Yes. What's the bigger concept? Well, testing is a part of V and V. It's not its own separate entity. It, it, it is a largely a verification activity. I thought the question was going to be what's bigger verification or validation. So I have three contributions here. Michael Sterling says testing can either be characterization R and D or compliance B and V. Joanne Evans says validation and verification steps into GMP. Verification is testing. Testing comes in design controls. And Jan says V and V is broader. Thanks for Joe's education, everybody. Uh, here's another question. Um, I don't, I'm not aware of what firms are testing firms other than yours right now. I've never researched it. I've never needed to make a decision about this. Are there many testing firms? Do you have a lot of competitors? Um, yeah, I mean, so, so again, it depends how you define testing. So there's, uh, you know, there's, so we specialize mostly in the destructive and non-destructing. We have competition all over the globe that, that does what we do. 
Um, not every test lab has, you know, special, not every test lab can perform testing for um, all the different devices that are out there. So some may focus on cardiovascular, some may focus on orthopedics. Element does a lot of different, you know, types of industries as well, diagnostic and therapeutic devices and so forth. So th there's definitely competition out there, but a lot of it is, is specialized as well. Um, so as a simpleton, I, you know, I hear regulatory inequality and I say, Michelle, I say Rob Packard. If I hear testing, is that just too big for me to just say, oh, that's my shake? No, I mean, no, absolutely not. I mean, I think that, I think it inevitably, if someone is talking about testing, either we can support or point them in the right direction. And then it just depends on, you know, what, what aligns and what doesn't. So if they're doing biological testing for biocompatibility, we don't really, we do a little bit of that, but we, we don't necessarily offer the full suite. So it just depends on what process they are there. But yeah, I mean, as related to testing, I, I can definitely help. I'm asking the audience, have you hired a testing agency before? And if so, which? And was it a good experience? And uh, how often do you, what, uh, what's your understanding of how often firms outsource testing versus attempt to do it in-house and any, you know. Well, I'll, I'll tell you my experience. I've started using Element in the last year um, because some of the service I was getting at the, the larger firms was subpar. It, and the larger firms are um, a lot of times sucked up. Like if a Medline or somebody comes in, you go to the bottom of the list and they, they do whatever testing, you know, the big ways want. And um, Element really uh, did a, a great job with some of my smaller clients because they needed education, they needed support, they needed that protocol, help even selecting the test. Um, so- That's a uh, nice endorsement for you. What? I said that's a nice endorsement for Mache. Mm -hmm. I, pre I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Jan says she goes with the company closest to where the product is made. I don't know how, how good they are, but okay. I suppose that's one approach. Um, do you have more to the presentation or was this your last slide? Yeah, I mean, that, that was really last slide. Maybe one more point to cover as well. You know, one of the things that needs to be considered is is just kind of the, the end regulatory body. So if it's FDA or CE or Anvisa or PMDA, as you're going through this, if you're targeting a specific, you know, initial um, submission, you know, if you're going to go to Japan predominantly, that's a whole different animal. Um, and, and, there's a lot of requirements, additional requirements around data, um, data integrity, things like that from a testing perspective. And so making it clear, even in your protocol of sort of what, where you're planning to go, or at least communicating that can save a lot of headache on the, on the front end, because we almost have a different process depending on, on where it's going through. So um, that's just the last, last sort of quick comment from a regulatory perspective, but you know, that, that wraps it up, that wraps it up for me here. Um. Please find out for me who did your corporate photography because it's really good. I really like how clean it looks. Um, if there are any questions, please. Um, and uh, I thought that was great. I am going to do what I always do, which is I like to give first time members a chance to introduce themselves. So I am going to elevate uh, Chris. Joe, I, I have to hop off now, so okay. I'm going to say bye to everybody. Thank you. Bye, Michelle. Thanks, Mosh. That was a great presentation. And Jeff, I think it's your first time. And Rob is our newest friend. He joined yesterday. And I think I have to do fancy things to let them talk. Unmute. 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 Oh, there's Rob. Oh, did I... Did I push Rob? Oh, I pushed the wrong Rob. Well, we love him anyhow. Hi, Joe. Hi, Robert. I met <laughs> the other Rob. Now, don't put any questions. Nobody likes that slide. Let's see. Jeff Levine, you're good first. Good afternoon, or good 
morning by you guys. Hi. Tell us about you. Um, well, first, glad to be here. I've been uh, following and uh, interacting with this group for probably a couple of years at this point. Um, I am a CEO of a startup company that's building an intraoperative machine vision platform. Uh, the idea is to improve uh, registration and intraoperative re-registration of soft and rigid tissue uh, for the likes of Medtronic and Brain Lab and anybody with an image-guided navigation system. And we are just uh, did our first pilot study recently, have some IP approved, finishing our second raise. Um, and uh, this presentation, like uh, many of the others that I stalk, uh, have been really useful. So thank you. Thank you, Jeff. What, uh, what would you say is the thing you most need right now to get to the next stage of development for your company? Um, I think we're pretty good. You know, it really comes down to money. Um, so we're, we have all the commitments. We're closing our second round. That'll allow me to hire a few more people. Mm -hmm. uh, we have partnerships with um, Medtronic and a few hospitals and uh, some brain modeling experts out of Europe. Um, so I think we're good at the moment. I guess what I need is a continued resource to keep learning uh, what I need to do next. Um, and I've spoken with Michelle and Joe and a couple of others on this call, so I'm getting it. Welcome, Jeff. Rob, our newest member, welcome. Howdy. So uh, Rob Stahlburn, I'm the CEO of Optimal Device. We're an engineering consulting firm, mainly specializing in simulation and design. So kind of this presentation, I like to do my work before the testing gets done so that the testing comes back and actually works out well but sometimes it's on the, the back end to try to fix a, a problem. So we, uh, thank you for welcoming me. We had back in, I think it was October of 2018, uh, we had a presentation from Arlen Ward and from Structural Integrity Associates at 10X. And Structural did like pore sign testing and Arlen did, uh, Computer simulation testing. Okay. Um, which are you? Uh, computer simulation. So okay. finite element analysis is one of my bread and butters. Are you uh, independent? Is it just you? Yes. Yep. Okay. Well, if you haven't met Arlen yet, I'll happily make that introduction. Cool. Thank you. And it seems that Chris had to drop off. So we'll have to catch him next time. Uh, let's see, too. And it looks as though there's another question, and I'm learning how to use these platforms. An anonymous attendee has written something, and I do not know who that is. What would it be, an anonymous attendee? Oh, I bet I know who it is. Is it Nikki? I bet it's Nikki. Because she, the same anonymous attendee, attendee said a company in the UK did the photography, which is weird, because you're in... Seattle area, right, Mache? So I'm in Cincinnati. Nikki's oh. in the Seattle area. Yeah. Okay. But so our, our, pay our firm company came in to photograph you? That sounds weird. Our company is headquartered in London. But you were photographed. Yeah, I mean, so so we have 200 locations worldwide, and they had a camera oh, wow. crew, that, several How camera crews did? that came around and do it. Yeah. How many employees? Uh, close to 7,000. Okay, I had no idea. Thank you. This is a little company? <laughs> wow. Uh, I believe Nikki writes, it depends on the test required. Most companies do not have all the necessary equipment to do testing themselves. We do, yeah, it's her. We do two types of outside testing, pre-testing to make sure the product passes, then certification testing, which is the official testing for FDA, UL, et cetera. Okay, now it may not be her. Element sounds like it could do both. I'm not sure who offered that. So if you choose to identify yourself, please do so. Um, and that's all the questions I have here. And I'm not smart enough in this topic to ask anything intelligent. Um, Masha, you want to you wanna wrap up with uh, any final thoughts? Sure. 
Yeah, no, I, I think this is great, great questions. Um, it seems like, you know, all of us involved in any of this med device are coming across testing here or there. Element would love to give you, uh, earn your, earn your business, but outside of that, I'm more than happy to, to answer any questions and continue participating as a member of this community here. So thanks Joe for your time and having me on here. And, uh, now, where are you right now? Is that a real brick wall? It, it, it is not. I'm in my home office and, uh, it is a three dimensional wallpaper. It looks, it's just a wallpaper, but it mm. makes it look like I'm, I don't know. In some That's the best practice. kind of wallpaper thing I've seen. Not only did it a fool me, but B, I'm not seeing any kind of like shadow or, or something like it seems happens so often with these. I'm going to have to learn a trick or two from you. Yeah, I, I, the room is pretty symmetrical. So I'm right, like right dead center in the window here in front of me and then mm -hmm. it's perpendicular back there. And there's actually kind of a running joke. So I'll, I'll zoom around here just so you can see. But so I've got a big New York City mural that looks like a big window out there. So the running joke is that, you know, when they, people call me and I'm working from home, that Mache is working from the 77th floor of Jakuki Towers in, in New York City. Towers. Uh, that's a, but I'm really, I live in Kentucky, so just south of Cincinnati, and uh, I'm, I'm in suburbia, but it makes me feel like, like I'm a bit more urban, maybe. <laughs> okay. Well, if you come out to other urban uh, spots, I'm sure some members on the call would, would gladly host you. Um, that concludes today's call, folks. Thanks, everybody. This was our first Zoom. Thanks for tolerating while I followed, figured things out. And for all you Go Tea lovers, you'll still have Masha next week. I think this is going to go after Tuesday. It's my last COVID call on Tuesday. And uh, this was kind of my COVID thing. I don't know what I'm going to do with my hands. <laughs> Ironically, I touch my face more now than ever, which was kind of not the point. You got to get one of these little widget things that has different buttons and circles and. Oh, that's what we do with our hands. That's what that's what that's what stays in the left hand over here. <laughs> <laughs>